But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in, command, in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told Israel, the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts here today be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So, I had a conversation with a colleague just recently, a friend of mine, uh, on why Transfiguration Sunday matters. Why do we have a Sunday set aside every single year to talk about the Transfiguration? Now, we're not reading about the Transfiguration today, but we know, you know, that's when Jesus takes James, Peter, and John up to the mountain, and, and he's transfigured before them, and Elijah and Moses, Moses come, come there, and Peter says, hey, let's stay here forever. And Jesus says, no, we're not going to stay here forever, we're going to come back down. So why does it matter? Why talk about transfiguration? Why talk about it every single year? Why mark our calendars in a liturgical season with this Sunday, with this event in, in the life of Jesus or, or the life of faith? Why does it matter to do this? And at first I was like, you're right, I don't understand why it matters. I really don't get it. Why celebrate this really kind of random moment that seems to be just there? But as I thought about it a little bit more, I realized something. To be transfigured means to be transformed or elevated. To be transformed, it literally means to be transformed into something beautiful and elevated up. It marks the separation from epiphany into Lent, to be elevated, to be transformed. It marks a time when we're supposed to be really working on a connection between us and God and stepping into that 40 days of Lent. It delineates us from being on the mountain of Epiphany, on the experience of the birth of Christ in the coming of the wise men in those times to a time where we are trying to get a deeper, more connected relationship with God. Isn't that what Lent's about as we come into it? So we get ready to step into Lent. Isn't Lent about when we give something up, when we take something on to have a deeper, more fulfilled relationship with God? I've realized that it's an important marker in the life of faith because it's about transformation. And Jesus is constantly telling us that we have to transform. It's a marker of what happens when we connect fully with the divine. It means that we are supposed to be being turned into something more beautiful. We mark this moment each year as we process into Lent. We mark it because we are supposed to be transforming our lives of faith. It's like Paul says, the old life is gone. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. We are a new creation. We are transformed. I want to talk about this with Moses a little bit because it's a little bit different story to talk about on Transfiguration Sunday. So we come to this text where Moses is on Mount Sinai and he comes down from Mount Sinai and he's shining. His face is shining. And we find Moses coming down the mountain to the people. But we have to go back a little bit further because they've been traversing through the desert for a long time. This is, this is not the first time Moses has climbed this mountain. It's the third time. He climbs this mountain the first time. He goes up, and God speaks with him, and he gets the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, and as he's getting ready to come back down, God says, you better get back down there. Those people are acting a fool. And they are. Because in the period of time that Moses is gone, they have told Aaron, 
hey man, Moses is gone. We're out. This God thing, it's not even. We're out of Egypt. We got nothing. We're eating stuff off the ground that the birds are leaving. This is absurd. You need to make us something to worship. And Aaron goes, we worship God. And they said, no, you need to make us something to worship. So they take all their gold earrings and all their rings and they melt them and they make this golden calf. And God sees it and says, Moses, you better go. So Moses goes down the mountain and in his anger, he smashes the Ten Commandments. He breaks them. He's so furious that he is more than willing to let the whole Israelite population die. He's fed up with them. You can't last a week or 40 days or whatever it is that I'm up on the mountain without creating something to be idolatry and to worship other than God. So he traverses back up the mountain. And he's up there for a good bit of time. And God convinces him that we don't need to kill them all. We don't need to get rid of him. So he comes back down and, uh, and, and he speaks and he interacts with God. And, and then he goes back up the third time. And each time he goes up and he comes down, he's a better person for it because he's face to face with God. He experiences the divine. He connects with the divine. And this time he spends 40 whole days with God getting the new tablets the New Ten Commandments, but he also gets to experience seeing God, the backside of God. God says, you can't see my front side, you can only see my backside, so I'm going to pass you by and you will get to see me. You get to experience me, you get to see God. So he sees God. He, he has an intimate, connected relationship with the divine in that moment. He spends 40 long days connected with God by himself, alone, in the fog and in the mist, connected with the divine, and he comes back down, looking a lot like Tomatoa on Mo uh, Moana, for those of you who've watched this thing, and I'm so shiny. There you go, I did it, you're welcome. He's shiny. He's scary, he's intimidating to the people. And he has the tablets, and he speaks to them, and he can't understand why they're scared of him. He doesn't understand, I'm connected with God, I've got, I'm, I'm better, I'm a, I'm a better person for this. And he calls Aaron and the Israelites, and they, they begin to talk, and he gives the commandments, and he shares with them who he's who they're all called to be. You ever been around someone like this? You ever been around with someone who's just in tune with the divine? They look different, they feel different, they just are different. I've been around people, it feels like, in portions of their life that they are connected, so deeply connected. One of them, and, and, and he's I, I, Reverend Bill and Hastings, who was a pastor at First Price Hastings while I was in college. And he, I don't know, I can't even explain it. He was, he's just, it's just God. It's just there. And, and when you hang out with him, you just, you see it and you feel it. And he's just deeply in tune with God. He spends this time. And he's not the only person, but there's been other people in my life. David Bartlett is one of them that I can think about. Just, just connected. Just connected. Has had that intimate face-to-face -face contact with God, and we can feel it and see it. They've been transfigured. Turned into something more beautiful. Elevated. Not in a holier-than-thou, look at me, I'm better than you because I've got some more time to spend with God. But in a way that we experience it and we want that same thing. And not that envious way, but we know that it is a connection that we need just as bad. That's what God's calling us to. That's what God desperately wants. I, I know it seems somewhat cliche, and we've heard it a hundred thousand different ways and a hundred thousand different times, but God wants a deep and abiding personal contact and relationship with us. A personal relationship. Jesus wants a personal relationship with us. It's not language you hear often from Presbyterians or from me, but a personal relationship, an intimate relationship. God is intimate. God creates out of love and compassion. God wants that same kind of relationship back. Community. We are called to be in that kind of relationship with God. We'll talk about one another here after a while, but I am simply talking about our relationship with the divine. An honest relationship. 
Because here's the deal. Moses goes in every time to see God. He goes into the, the tabernacle that they have built, and he pulls the veil off his face. He, put, he, he does it. I don't know why. I've never been able to figure it out. To protect the people from a shiny face, I guess. But when he goes in to experience God and connect with God and to talk with God, he takes the veil off. He strips the, the, the dividing piece off to go in and talk to God. In Richard Rohr's book, The Naked Now, he talks often about being naked before God. Strip the layers away. No false pretense, no, no facades, no veils, just you and God, me and God. That's what God wants. Because here's the deal. God knows our heart anyways. So go ahead and lie to God. Go ahead and try to make deals with God. God knows anyways. So what good does it do any of us to try to pull the wool over God's eyes? Because he can't. God wants an intimate, connected, honest relationship. One where we don't hide who we are. One where the layers are stripped back and we, we just are there and it is raw. And here's the, here's the deal. So do we. So do each and every one of us. We want authentic relationship. No pretense. No stuff. No cars, no clothes, no any of that junk. Just us connected to one another. I know it's what we crave. I hate to use the millennial example, but millennials mean I'm one of them. My generation just wants authentic relationships. That's what all the research says. That's what all the Pew studies say. If the church would just give an absolute 100% authentic relationship, you'd see them. That's just it. But here's the deal. God wants that. We're created in that image. We want that. So why not have that with God? First and foremost, stripped away raw. Go to God to tell the truth. Go to God to laugh, to cry, to scream, to stomp, to, 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 to be angry, to wave our fists in the air, to be completely authentic, to share our heartache and to rejoice. God desperately wants that. That's in fact all God wants from First and foremost, that proximity, that closeness. Here's the deal. No one's authentic on first meeting. How many of y'all went on first dates at some point in your life? 100% uh, raw and authentic, right? Layers stripped away and you just were like, blah, truth, blah, here you go. And they went, I'm out. <laughs> Woo, boy. That person's crazy. First date with God. that alone time. God wants that 40 days on the mountain just you and God. Just me and God. And here's the thing. We have to do it. And when I say be alone with God, I mean be alone with God. This is great. This is important. This is as valuable as it gets. But we all need to go from here and be alone with God. Just Aaron and God. Just Diane and God. That's it. No one else. Just you and God. See, we've got to climb the mountain to get there first, right? The mountain of excuses. Well, I don't have time. Well, I don't have, I don't have a space. If I go in there, then the dogs will be at the door and they'll be whining and barking. You know what? Dogs can whine and bark. But if I go in there, the kids will want to come in. You know what? Kids can try to come in. The beautiful thing is, the kids will see that you are being alone with God, and you'll imitate that for them. And they'll recognize that's something they need to do in their lives. We make so many excuses, and those are the mountains for us to climb. Those are where we're trying to get on top of so that we can be alone with God. I don't have time. I don't have space. I don't have this. Just do it. 
Nike's made millions of dollars over billions and billions of dollars over the course from the 80s to now saying, just do it. Christians should market it, put the little cross with a swoosh and say, just do it. Just do it. You just have to do it. I make just as many excuses. Well, meditation doesn't work for me. Well, singing doesn't work for me. Find something that does. I can't tell you what spiritual practice is going to work for you. I can't. It's just, I don't know. You're not me. I can sit for 30 minutes in silence with my legs crossed on a pillow in my, in my office, breathing, and I'm, I'm coming 40 days off the ground. You can ask my wife. It's weird. She thinks it's crazy. I come out of my office and she's like, whoa, you're different. But that may not work. You may need to just stand in the corner and sing as loud as you can. Whatever songs, whatever hymns, or play an instrument, or, or whatever it is. Do that. Get up on top of the mountain and be alone with God. We have to climb that mountain. Every single day. I don't have time. Well, do you happen to drive to Iowa City on work to work? Okay. Do you turn the music up or listen to some silly talk show or whatever? Turn it off. Pray. Talk. Yell. Don't speed. I get to yell and I get to speed. Find a way. Find a time. Take a closet. Sit in the closet. It's weird, but you know, sit in the closet. The kids can't mind you in a closet. Put up, put up. Well, yeah, they can. I don't know. I just looked at Wendy Jo and she was like, you won't bet. Asa can find me anywhere. <laughs> find a way to alleviate the distractions and just do it. And here's the deal. That proximity to God, people will take notice. People notice. They see it. And they want it. They want to be part of it because they see how connected to the divine you are. That you have something going on. Something. They may not be able to name it, but they want it. They know it. We all are tuned to want that thing. Even the crazy atheists who are out there screaming, there's no God. You know what they want? Deep down, they're tuned to want that. People notice. I'll leave you with this really great example that I, that I was thinking about. Well, I read about and I also thought about it further. So we got little ones in here, right? We don't have the stouters. Dang it. Very quintessential example. They turn around in the pew, don't they, Stacy? Especially Reese. She turns around and she looks at you and she looks back there and sees Doris and Ben. And, 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 and Reese is a fairly stoic baby. Let's go with that. Stone faced. But they turn around and they see you in this worshipful way and they often look like to do something. Smile. Do you know why they smile? Because your face is shining. Think about all those little ones who turn around and look at you and they smile. They see it. They know it. They see what's happening in their face. Thanks a lot. <laughs> she ain't got anybody to turn around and look at except her dad, so that's just the end of the story. They see it though. These little ones see it. And it's just like us. When we see it, we recognize it. We can't help but smile and want to be part of it. Brothers and sisters, just do it. Make time for it. If it's in the office, if it's in the car, if it's in a closet, if it's in the bathroom, if it's in the shower, I don't care. If it's in nature, just do it. If it starts as five minutes, great. If it becomes 30 minutes, fantastic. If it becomes an hour and you can make an hour, that's even more incredible. But we all have to climb our mountain of distractions and our mountain of excuses to spend our 40 days alone with God. And when we do, when we dare to, the world will take notice and will be a phenomenally better place because of each and every one of us. Amen. Having heard the word read and proclaimed, let us stand together in body or in spirit and say what it is we believe.
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We come to the time of service where we generously give back what we've been blessed with. We return it with gratitude and thanksgiving to be used to further the kingdom here and now. We do not give out of abundance, but out of a rich and deep faith. 